Welcome to Insights and Sound, where we talk to the people behind the scenes, behind the technology, and behind the music. People you may not know, but you should. My guest is Howie Schwartz of Howard Schwartz Recording. And uh, good to see Hi. you, Howie. <laughs> good to see you, Dick. So, um, yeah, we're, we were we were just shooting the breeze about New York and about uh, living in living in Europe and all of that stuff. But um, I want to first set the Wayback Machine because I know you um, you and I have had a little bit of this conversation before. Your background was more technical than musical, right? Uh, actually, the other way around was more musical than technical. I went to the Eastman School of Music. I played the bassoon. Mm -hmm. Um, that was my major. Um, I got a full scholarship to Eastman. Uh, I graduated in 93, honorary. They gave me a degree because they asked me to leave after my first year at Eastman. Uh, my my across <laughs> the hall roommates were Tony Levin and Steve Gadd um, at Eastman. And, Did that have you know, anything to do with the reason you were asked to leave? Um, <laughs> no, actually, it's a great story. because I worked at a nightclub called the El Echo Lounge in Rochester. Um, for extra money, because my parents gave me, I think, $10 or $15 a week in 1964. Uh, to, money. Uh, as an allowance, was, it was okay money, but it wasn't enough for me. And I got asked to play bass. I also play the bass at, uh, with a folk group. And um, I used to work till like 1 o'clock in the morning and then drag my tush home. And uh, I wouldn't get a lot of sleep. My first class the next morning was an eight o'clock theory, music theory class. You know, do, me, so, do, so, me, do. And I go, okay. So I um, didn't have a class after that until I think 11 or 12. And I used to go up to the practice rooms. There was a building across the street from the Eastman Theater an Eastman school that uh, had practice rooms that we all were in. There was a double read room and there was a a percussion room and a marimba room and you know all kinds of craziness and that and I could never sleep because everybody was smoking up there and stuff and so one day I snuck into the Eastman Theater 3200 seats McKim Mead White one of the most beautiful perfect theaters ever and on the third balcony there were all these couches in the and I would sleep on one of those couches one day I got kicked awake by the head of the school because I had gone to sleep there at like 9.15. And she looked at me and she said, do you see who's on the stage? You uh, have to get up because you're snoring and you're bothering Mr. Aaron Copeland, who Oops. was conducting the Rochester Philharmonic. So <laughs> that was the beginning of the end. <laughs> well, at least you were bothering somebody of significance, you know. Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, it was uh, he he played there every year. Um, and, um, you know, the, the Eastman, the Rochester Philharmonic was good, but the Eastman Wind Ensemble was unbelievable. So it was a lot hmm. of fun. Oh, too funny. So, so that's my, when I got out of, then I it was a disc jockey. Uh -huh. And what I learned at uh, being a disc jockey in, the, in Europe, they sent us, I was in the army and I was, worked for Armed Forces Radio and they would send me to Europe, send me all around. We got issued a Nagra Kudowski tape recorder, mm -hmm. a mono, and um, a Sennheiser 421 or whatever the predecessor to the 421 was, the silver one. Oh yeah. Silver mm -hmm. and gray. <clears throat> and they said, okay, today you're interviewing the general, you're interviewing this person, uh, tomorrow you've got Oscar Peterson. And every day I went to interview somebody else. And I learned how to be a good interviewer because I learned how to edit myself. And so we worked on these AEG and Telefunken tape machines that had a little button that you would push in that, and the scissors would come out. And this is, you know, before... Every machine had a splicer. A splicing block, wrote, yeah. Uh -huh. Edit all. Edit all splicers. So I got to be a really great editor. When I got out of the service, um, I went out to Hollywood to seek my fortune and uh, wound up being an editor working at an old radio station um, a recording studio called C.P. McGregor Recording, which in its later... Uh, 
form became Wonderland. Oh, sure. And Over on uh, Coanga, right? On, no, it was on uh, uh, Western and Wilshire. Okay. You know, okay. Where, Bob's, where, where the Wiltern Theater is, uh -huh. on the opposite side of the street, three blocks in on the other side of Bob's Big Boy, uh, was this nondescript building that had this gigantic studio in it. And then people like Nat King Cole and Ozzie Nelson and Harriet Hilliard, as in Ozzie and Nelson, they had a band. Harriet was the singer, Ozzie was the conductor. Nat King Cole had a show called King Cole's Court. And all these records, all the discs where they cut them were still there. And they were sitting in this room. They broadcast live from there. And it was part of radio networks were the red network, the blue network. and Right. Then, you had NBC and, Red. You had NBC Blue or something like that. One of them spun then, off, yeah, I remember. They, ABC yeah. was another one, American, uh -huh. and then Columbia. So um, this was just radio, though. It was not TV. It was, sure. you know. Or in the 30s. And so I would put those up on the lathe and listen to them. I mean, it was just, it was one of those places with a nine foot Steinway and, uh, and just a lot of space and a lot of famous actors and actresses coming in and recording an old time radio show called Heartbeat Theater, sponsored by the Salvation Army, which was always about somebody who was in distress and the, the person, the, the, somebody from the Salvation Army would come and rescue them. And I met. That's where I met Gary Owens, and became very good friends, you know, from beautiful downtown Absolutely. Berlin. Absolutely, and yeah. Gary, Gary and I were good friends and uh, up until he died. And uh, there are a lot of stories about these. There was a show called The Millionaire. And uh, that was about a guy who would go around, Michael Anthony, would go around and give a check for a million dollars to somebody different every week in the show. And the guy who played Michael Anthony was one of those guys with the big boys. Um, and we became friends also. And he had an unbelievable car collection. He had been making a fortune of money for a very long time. And then I went from there and I went to work for Mel Blanc, the voice of Bugs Bunny. Did we do this once before? No, no. And in fact, I didn't know you were, you were associated with Mel Blanc. Now, there's a character. Yeah. Uh, there's a, a whole quite cast a character. of characters. I, yeah. I got a lot of stories about <laughs> Mel Blanc. Um, his son, Noel, and I still are in sort of contact. Um, but Mel was quite interesting. He had just been recovering from, he was in a terrible car accident on Dead Men's Curve on Sunset Boulevard in his Lamborghini or, you know, he, he was the number one. The same place that Jan Berry wiped out. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But, I, but, was, I was friends um, with Jan for a long time. But, no, but uh, Mel survived. He was in an iron lung when he was doing the Flintstones. Oh, boy. He was Barney on the Flintstones. How appropriate. Yeah. Hmm. And so, and then he was on the Jetsons, too. Uh, but and all in the, in the iron lung. And, wow. And uh, they used to roll his bed out of the house and then back into the house and record him. And he didn't need to see any pictures because they drew to his lines. And because of all the... Uh, great contract that he had. Um, he uh, uh, just made a fortune of money. He had a watch collection that was unbelievable. He had what's called repeaters, where you pushed a button and it told you what time it was. It was for, and they were gold and silver. And he had this room built in his living room, and he had hundreds of them. And they were each worth a couple of hundred grand. It was Quite something. Hmm. So uh, anyway, we, uh, we were at Crossroads of the World was where the studio was. Oh, I remember that place. Yeah, there used yeah. to be a, a studio in there called, was it Baby O, I think, or something like that? Yeah, it was, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. it was two kinds of things. Uh, I think uh, a, a lot of actors had their offices in there because it was, it was cheap after, during the war, they closed it down and then it took a while for it to come back you know, uh -huh. because it looked German. And so the, it was. It was. <laughs> it was a, a very interesting. But Michael, Michael, and Sarah had an office across the way, and there were uh, a few other companies in there. Like you would come outside, and there'd be a naked woman uh, standing on a stairway. It was, you know, that kind of. It was Hollywood Boulevard. So old was, Hollywood, you know, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was old Hollywood. So it was. Um, 
It was a very interesting. And then from there, I uh, went to work for Wally Heider as an editor again, and then I wound up being a mixer. So you're so, so you basically you learned all your technical stuff in the army, and then just then just parlayed it into a career in in on the technical yeah. side with half of, half of the stuff that I did. Nobody knew about. There was certainly no place to learn how to do it in school. Right. Um, right. In the in the sixties and seventies. I mean, uh, uh, I got to Hollywood in sixty eight. So it was the beginning of the warehouse had just opened. So yeah, yeah. And you, you were learning. I mean, everybody was just learning that stuff on the fly. by doing. People were building their own consoles, and you oh, know, Frank Video. You bet. Frank yeah. Video built all these cool consoles for Wally and mm -hmm. for the Beat Boys and for you know a, a lot of people. And then Tom Hidley was just getting into the business, sure. building trucks and building control rooms, and um, that was a lot of fun. But Wally bought one of Tom Hidley's trucks, and. He and I took it out to, to the Redlands, and we recorded. He said, what are you doing today? And I went, well, he would say, Wally Heyer was this bigger-than-life guy, 300-some pounds, six foot five, and he stuttered. And, and he would always go, boop, 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 boop. hi, Wally. <laughs> what, what are you doing today? And I said, uh, what do you got in mind? He says, come on, we're going to the Redlands. And we get in a truck and go to Redlands to record uh, Stan Kenton. Oh, okay. And the recordings are unbelievable. If you if you want to hear a great recording, go on YouTube. Stan Kenton Redlands concerts. There's a few of them, and Wally was the engineer. Sitting now, were these the, were these multi-track in those days, or no. it was all two-track and three-track stuff? Right. Uh, actually, I think the last one I did with him was in the in the was 16-track in the um, Hidley truck. But with an analog console, with an analog, uh, of course, uh, Frank Demidio console with mm -hmm. rotary pots. Oh yeah, with the big bake light knobs on it and stuff. Uh -huh. Yeah, because we could take it in and out. It was built on a skid, and you lift it up, put the thing underneath, and roll it outside onto the street. Because none of the studio, there was no lobby. Portable. You, just, you know, everything <laughs> was portable in Wally's world, and so um, it's all portable. It just depends how many people you need to carry it, right? Right. <laughs> well, that was one of the jobs that I had also, is that he, he when 3M invented the, their 16-track machine, um, he bought all of them that he could uh -huh. and rented them to everybody else. So um, he had four Econoline super vans and... Mm -hmm. Us, us, you know, the little pishers would they, they say, okay, Neil Young needs, I was just talking to John Nolan yesterday, well, in sure. one of our yeah. rooms, at the, and he, he's after that, but we used to have to drag a 16 track up to Neil's house and the last 50 yards are stairs. And so we would drag it up there, and then I would stick around. Uh, I do remember doing Leon Russell, where I was delivering the tape machine, and his engineer didn't show up, so I wound up doing the session at Sky Hill Studios. Yeah, that and seemed he, to happen I, a lot with Leon, because yeah, Lenise Le yeah. and I have talked about, about that with Leon, too. That seemed to be a, a thing where you all of a sudden became Leon's engineer because the last guy didn't show up or something. That's right. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, it, and it was fun. And it was, uh, Lenise and I had Lenise Bent and I had a long conversation because she worked with Leon after I left Hollywood. Mm -hmm. um, the earthquake in '71 was it for me? Oh, was that the it? Silmar, I was going to ask Silmar you why you uh, went brought why you back to New York. To, okay, uh -huh. I uh, went to Toronto for a short stint um, in back in radio, um, and then I got back into recording with Dave Green and in uh, uh, the. Uh, Andy Hermont, which was Manta Studios and in Toronto, and uh, Gordon Lightfoot. And then uh, it was time to come to New York. And so I came to New York in 72. So let, let's back up a little bit, because there's one thing there that kind of fascinates me. Um, you know, when, when I started working in recording, it was uh, probably, you know, I guess, mid-'80s. And so, you know, my first... My first uh, home studio was a, a TAC four track reel to reel. Wow. Yeah. But I was always, I've always been fascinated about the idea of the transition from 
single, you know, basically two track live recording to multi track. And, you know, it, it, what's fascinating to me, especially, is how that kind of changed the whole complexion of how people recorded. Because once you could overdub, right. That really that that changed didn't that change really kind of the whole nature of how you worked in the studio? Yeah, there were two people that were very involved in that. Uh, one one's name was uh, a guy named Selson, who invented Selsync. Do you remember? Oh, there was a sure, sure. Which which moved it so that you could record off of you could play back off the record off the head. record head yes he and made, the TAC machines the had that that there was a big enough gap between each track that you could do that so there was no bleed mm -hmm. and Les Paul who Les invented Paul of course track, he he overdubbed himself in the first on four tracks with this guy Selson and uh -huh. um, so <clears throat> I used to work at, at Mel Blanc when we were putting a, a thing together. We didn't have any multi-tracks. We had leader tape mm -hmm. <laughs> and we had four machines. And they were all, you know, all mono because we were just doing radio commercials. There was no such thing for us to do stereo in those days for radio. Right. Uh, right. It was AM. So uh, you would uh, roll the tape back, put the leader tape in exactly the same place on the four, a uh, three, 351 mm -hmm. uh, Ampex machines. Two. And then watch the tape and watch the white go by and, until he got, And uh -huh. then you go one, yeah. two, three, and you'd hit the f three start <laughs> buttons at the same time. <laughs> uh, we, we got somebody to invent a remote that would flip the switch, the, uh -huh. the solenoids to do all three machines at once. Cause it was, you know, we were like doing it like, yep. you know, like Marianne Wood yep. in the Nixon tapes. <laughs> so uh, that was a, a lot of fun trying to get, and if it was wrong, you stopped and you went back. Yeah. And if yeah. you did it exactly right and it was off a little bit, then you would you cut a little piece out of this and you cut a little piece. And we were always had, we always had restrictions because we had to cram everything into a 60, 60 seconds. Of course. We sure. were doing radio commercials. Sure. So it wasn't like you just rolled the tape and then you faded out. <laughs> commercials ended. <laughs> so it was, it was a, thinking back on it now, considering what we're doing today. This, you know, this, oh, I mean, the cool part was that we have we had real scrub. You know, you took the course. reels and you rocked them, rocked them back and forth to listen to where the actual edit was. Yes. And Wally invented a great thing, he, uh, which is one of the reasons he hired me. He bought all these old records from all these famous dudes. Um, and then we recorded them stereo, 30 IPS, no Dolby. There was no Dolby in those days. Um, and I, and it still was a record and no matter how good a cut it was, there was a click and a pop, but uh -huh. at 30 IPS, a click is this big. And so that's what I did. Oh, so you just cut out problems. all the cut out the splices, Click. basically. Uh huh. Yeah, and it didn't, you know, and you had to decide, okay, and you'd look on the, you'd look on a scope, and it would, and you'd just say, eh, okay, that one's not big enough to, you know, I kind of hardly hear that one, mm -hmm. but there were some that were serious, you know, and you had to take those out, and then you had to figure out, okay, how do I get it to be in tempo? Because if you're taking out too many clicks in one section, usually you got you know, one revolution to, uh, uh -huh, uh -huh. that it was the same, you know, it's like a scratch across the record and you could hear it every time it went around. Sure. Sure. So. But that, you know, to me, I think that must've really changed, you know, not just the, not just the technical aspects of recording, but really, you know, the, the way that musicians, artists, producers really approached it because all of a sudden you could say, you know, I'm going to overdub myself. I'm going to, you know, I mean, the, the, the idea of being able to do stuff in an arrangement that you just couldn't do live, mm -hmm. that's, you know, that, that's got to have been a kind of a sea change, almost, almost right up there with digital, you know? Yes. What we did, what we did um, when we were in Hollywood is we paid attention to what George Martin was doing. Well, or uh -huh. we went back to look what George Martin did because he stretched the boundaries oh, yeah. as far as you could go. I mean, playing oh, yeah. tape backwards and and uh, having the echo uh, go out and 
the, the, the delay on the decay, uh, you know, are you gonna pre-delay the signal or are you gonna delay the decay on another tape? And what we used to do is we used to string it up like Christmas tree lights, uh, uh, audio tape going through a machine. Uh -huh. And then we'd hang reels on the tape so that it wasn't flying in the air. And all it, it was like a Rube Goldberg situation where it was like, oh, oh my God. And we were always playing with how long the delay was, because if you just send a sound into an echo chamber, that sucks. It's just, you know, it's because there's still a wall that it has to bounce off of. And, right, right. You know, and remember going into rooms and, wow, this would be a really cool place because look at that <laughs> decay, that delay before the, the decay started or how long does the, I once went to one of the schools where a guy was, uh, a teacher was trying to teach a class about delay and decay. And it was, it was probably from a book. And I just said, oh, wait a minute. This, this is not real, you know, real life practice because that's not how it works. And why do you want to delay it? And, you know, if you have, you know, you had fold back. It was all, it was because we could have a delay coming from headphones, you know, headphones. And, uh, even though there was an echo knob on, on the old consoles, there was nothing. Uh -huh. so yeah. You'd, yeah. you'd take a pick from someplace in the, in the audio chain and then stick it in a machine and then bring it back on a fader. But we didn't have that many. You know, if you had a good day, you had 12 faders. So <laughs> I remember when, it, when I was at the beginning of SPARS, we were always we were trying to figure out who qualified, you know, what studios did we want to have in, uh, in, in SPARS. So you had to have at least 21, 24 track room in order to qualify to beat with the big boys. Then there was other le right. levels. We didn't want the rules to be changing because of a manufacturer or because of some guy who's got a sync liver. We didn't think about anything like that in those uh -huh. days. So anyway, I got a call from a from, uh, famous guy in Nashville who calls me up and he says, Howie, I got a problem. He says, some days I'm 18, some days I'm 22, but I'm never 24 tracks. I thought that was the stick because his machine didn't work. So and I thought that was funny. Do I still qualify? I said, yes, I'll let you in. So, but there was uh, going up to the multi tracks was was I mean just a four track was a big deal for us. Sure. I mean, I you know, I I remember learning to use a four track and being just overwhelmed by the idea that I could do all this stuff with it. And then right. of course, you know, MIDI came in, and at that point, you know, I was reduced to three tracks because I had to have time code on one track. But at the same time, the amount of stuff you could do, and every one of these, you know, iterations of technological development, it's not just that it changed the technology; it changed the whole creative process. Uh -huh. And the worst was being an engineer and having somebody tell you what to do. They used to call us Sparky. Hey, right. Sparky. Could you, hey, Sparky, you know, can you make this? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can, uh, can you take a couple of seconds out of that? I mean, or could, you know, can you tighten that up? I, uh, I don't want to hear him slurping his choppers or, you know, it looked, it sounds like he's doing too many things in his nose. And, uh, you know, and I, I mean, I can't tell you how many guys I used to have to just take their, inhales out because they were ridiculous because uh -huh. you know, we, were, we were using cbs volume axes so they would always you know the compressors uh -huh. so single single channel two compressors and put a pull tech in there but we were using 87s and 67s and uh, right. um, the, the stuff where you can hear the dates of the dimes in your pockets yeah it was you know um could you take your coat off please because the your newspaper is rattling too loud i mean it was just, please don't smoke in the studio don't blow the smoke in my microphone oh god yes you know, yes I, I used to go every studio went out of business i went and bought their microphone so that was uh yeah, it was 40 years of doing that sure sure well you know it's funny um when i when i moved to germany it was uh basically early 90s and, oh, you know, everything. the wall had come down in like 88, 89. And, 89. Yeah, and well, I remember November talking 89. to a whole bunch of guys who, you know, they basically went over, especially I, I met this one producer in Berlin, 
And he told me, you know, yeah, I went over to, um, there was a town called Frankfurt am Oda, which was all the way in, yeah, in the very, very far east near the Polish border. Russia. Polish border, right. And he was telling me a story. He went into this shop and he found like a whole bunch of old Neumanns and old Telefunkens, mm -hmm. you know, the old bottle microphones and stuff like that. And he came up to the guy and he said, uh, you know, so what do you want for this stuff? And the guy said, oh, it's old crap, you know, uh, you know, I got a box of parts in the back too, you know. He ended up trading him two, two short SM58s for all this wow. stuff. <laughs> wow. Yeah, because they didn't well, know what they had back then. They had know? no idea. The, you know, the re were, tape was invented because of Adolf Hitler. Yes. He wanted to be in two places at one time. Mm -hmm. And um, he used to have his speeches recorded on record and every once in a while, you know, and, he, and he'd make copies of the records uh, and send them out with the big speakers, which worked and, and you know, mega, megaphones and stuff. And a guy would come out on the balconies of these buildings and looking like Hitler and he would talk like Hitler until somebody banged the table and would go, Bzzz! you know, the, and the needle would scratch across and he says, oh, I will not have this. So. He goes to Heidelberg and he tells, okay, A.G. AEG and Telefunken, you guys do it. Figure it out. Uh -huh. So they, uh, because magnetic film was already in, they did the magnetic tape. And so um, that's, a, you know, that's the old story about how did all the tape machines come over? Mm -hmm. There was three guys went when the Americans took over Heidelberg. Three guys went in and each one took what is now an Apex 300, the portable ones that were in the brown leather cases. Yep. And they each took one. One guy was Ampex, one guy was Fairchild, and I think one guy was Scully. I'm not sure what the, what. but there's th two of the three names came back and copied them. Wow. In the radio business, the uh, we use Fairchilds all the time. Uh, or Ma yeah, Maggie's. They were called Maggie's, uh, you know, we use little reels to put the commercials on. We didn't have mm -hmm. cartridges in those days, sure. when, you know, sure. 60s when I first went into radio. So it was, uh, it, it, you know, the whole transition of, of that. And we did what we could. It, 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 we just... Well, you know, and, it, and in certain ways, I think you actually did more. I mean, not not specifically being able to do more, but I think there was more of a challenge to make what limited resources you had work whereas yes. you know now you can do a million different things and you know there's almost no challenge to it in that sense well you know with all the stuff that's out there there, there was a lady uh, shirley k who worked for the spars forever she had a little studio called coconuts in mm -hmm. florida and she always said to me said you know it's a, not everybody who goes to med school becomes a doctor and so and Chris Stone, from the, who was one of the originators of the record plant, always mm -hmm. said that all this digital stuff, you know, the Sinclavirs and, the, and the, the, all the music computers, it said it makes it a democracy. Yes. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that it's good. It's, that means anybody who wants to can do it if you have enough money to buy one of those things, you know, like Pro Tools and stuff like that. Yes. But you still have to have talent. You still have to have ears. And, and sometimes you can't learn that. You have to experience that. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And that, uh, you know, I mean, that's the same thing that's tr true of present day. You know, there's plenty of, plenty of music out there now, but, uh, you know, yeah. yeah. The, I saw a number, 25,000 songs a week are released on, YouTube, on, on Spotify. Yikes. I mean, there's some ridiculous, some ridiculous numbers. And, and, and that was really hard for me to... To accept it, just I it's mean, overwhelming. It a, yeah, yeah, it's it's overwhelming. I grew up in the middle of an orchestra for for ten years. I sat in the middle of orchestras, and I heard everybody except the violin players, and I didn't miss much. I could get a record <laughs> and hear what the violin players play because the trombone and trumpet players were behind. The French horn was over here. Oboe was, uh, clarinet was next to me, oboe in front of me, and flew. It's amazing over there. you can still hear. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah but, but it was a good loud. Yeah, of yeah. course. Of there course. was no amplification, and nothing was amplified. Right, right. I mean, and when, then, when uh, I started playing classical orchestras uh, with the Budapest String Quartet in the University of Buffalo 
um, had a practice uh, had a practice room that had 40 foot ceilings and it had that metal junk, the absorptive metal sheeting on the wall. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, the, and the Buffalo Philharmonic had Tuscanini's NBC Symphony Orchestra library. I don't know how they got it, but they had it. And every Saturday morning I played with all these guys and girls and the Budapestrian Quartet guys would conduct us, Misha Schneider, Misha Dichter, all these names. And I got to play all these scores that all these musicians, the best musicians in the world were part of the NBC Symphony under Arturo Toscanini. And that's wow. where Studio 8H is. Studio 8H was built for him. You know, I was in that room once, and I think I was just overwhelmed by the history. You know, there's there certain rooms that you go in. Same thing with um, Abbey Road Studio 2. Right. You know, you walk mm -hmm. into that room, and you just, you can almost feel the ghosts, you know. Yeah. It's like I, I had the pleasure of being in Radio City with nobody else. Wow. And this is, you know, I, I was there because I was being taken on a tour of the recording studio on the top floor of Radio City, which is where the Rockettes rehearse and all. It was mind boggling. I did not know there was a studio up there. <laughs> oh yeah, there was a studio there for a, for a very long time. Um, I don't remember who ran it, but it was, it went, when it was taken over by Paramount, Paramount took over Radio City. Mm -hmm. Well, it's actually uh, not Paramount, it was uh, Optimum, whatever those guys, uh, uh, the Dolan family that owned Madison Square Garden, uh -huh. they, they took over the running of uh, Radio City as well. And so that was part of their, part of their venue. So there, there's all, you know, there's all kinds of historical places. Uh, last summer, two summers ago, uh, John Stork, the famous architect who built Electric Lady and all of my studios. Mm -hmm. Oh, he's, uh, he's, he's yeah. the man. He's the man. Uh, we, went to, uh, we went to Tanglewood, uh -huh. and we went there to see um, Rock to, Rachmaninoff's second piano concerto with, you know, uh, two and three, unbelievable, and to see the BSO, Boston Symphony Orchestra, play it, and it's, it's great. So uh -huh. we get there early because John Reed built the studio inside of uh, Symphony Hall in Boston. And so he has this like golden key to get into the backstage of Hungerwood. <laughs> so I, um, we're walking in backstage and they had sitting there on a, on a, on a cart were temple, temple bells with the big ones, these, the giant ones where you touch them and, go, and the sound right. just goes out. Uh -huh. And it was right at the door to the stage there's nobody on the stage. There's nobody in the audience. Just a few people, you know, waiting for the uh, one o'clock or two o'clock in the afternoon concert. And I'm standing there with the temple bells. And I start going with my finger to just hear the sound. And it was just, it was amazing because somebody figured out that that's a cool sound. You know, how, how did they make it? Did they spin it? Did they press it? Did somebody chisel it? It's a bell. It was so cool. Anyway. Well, and you know that the architecture of those kind of spaces. I mean, um, I well, remember they too, being they, in. They played um, with that forever. Oh yeah, you know, this well, way and that way. Yeah, I went to um, I went to Sicily with my wife. At one point, we were in one of those old Roman theaters. There's a theater ruin there, in. Um, Amphitheater. Um, yeah. Where is it? It's in uh, Gianni, Giannini Naxos or something like that, you know, near Syracusa. Anyway, oh, okay. and there's this old Roman theater where they even, they still have like the pits where the lions used to run mm -hmm. and stuff like that, you know. And um, I remember what really blew me away about that more than anything else was we climbed up into the, the seating area, you know, the surrounding seating area. And we're just sitting there and you could hear people down in the pit speaking as if they were right next to you. Because yep. they had the acoustics nailed, even you know, a couple thousand years ago, they figured it out. Yeah, there is, there's, there's uh, th one of the things in the, being in the audio business that's great is that your ears 
just take you to places where you've never been. Yes. There was a, there was a church in Boston. And I don't remember, it was on Boylston Street, and it's this famous church where you go in, and it's a round, it's called the Globe Room. Uh -huh. And you walk across a bridge in the middle of the Globe Room, and you are at the equator of the globe. Oh, it's a, uh, it had a light wherever they had a Christian science, oh, it's Christian science reading room. Uh-huh in Boston, and they had this thing called the Globe Room. I don't know if it exists anymore, but you would walk across, and anybody else who was on there, eventually, it, 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 you know, because it go right in your ears, uh -huh. because it's a circle. And uh -huh. it's a ceramic, you know, they put plaster and shiny, and it was a map with lights where all these Christian science reading rooms were. And the, the oral experience of somebody talking right into your ears was amazing. Sure, so sure. I, that was one. The other one is um, Dorothy Chandler Pavilion. Outside, <clears throat> where the, the there's drains and there's four columns and and the ceiling is like 50 feet high. Uh huh. And you clap your hands. We, we were recording Neil Young there, and I found this out by accident. And I went, because Wally used to go. That was his buzz to stop stuttering. He would clap his hands, and I clap my hands, and the sound went. Bing, 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 bing. And it took like 15 seconds for it to stop. Wow. Because it was a perfect standing wave. Uh-huh. It didn't cancel itself out. It just kept going. And wow. it was just, oh, my God. It's like, that's physics, <laughs> you know. It's true. Heaven or what. It, yeah. was, it was, but the Greeks knew how to do that. Yeah, and they the did. the Italians knew how to yeah. do that. I mean, they taught each other. Yeah, yeah. But it's, it's really true. And, and, you know, that to me is really kind of fascinating because, of course, you know, they didn't. They didn't have multi-track. They didn't have, you know, preamps and stuff. I mean, just the idea of understanding how to take these, how to calculate these acoustics to that point is just, you know, it's amazing to me. Respighi wrote a book, wrote a piece called The Pines of Rome, which is about the Roman, uh, what, what were they called, the Romans, when they would come back from uh, um, their battles. Oh, the gladiators. Around. The, right. the gladiators, and the, but it was they were called something else, and they would take the Via Appia, the Appian Way, <clears throat> and at the very end of the piece, it's called the uh, um, the Pines of it's called the Pines of Rome, Pines of the Appian Way, uh -huh. and it's about the 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 Roman fighters coming home, uh -huh. and one of the parts is a trumpet player has to go. Some place, or two trumpet players, have to go someplace other than on the stage to play this part to, to uh, imitate what it sounded like when the gladiators were announced by the uh, trumpets. Uh, and we go, da, 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 Anyway, it's, it's an amazing piece, and it really talks, uh, and I, every time I step in the Appian Way, it reminds me of that. Because if you go to Rome and you go through Tuscany, it's there. Yeah. Just, oh, this is the Appian Way, Via de Appia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, and, and even, you know, I mean, I've been in a lot of those old churches, especially in Europe, and, you know, even the smaller ones. I mean, the, the acoustics in those places is just phenomenal. Yeah. You know? <laughs> With John uh, John Stork, we were in uh, Tuscany two years ago for uh, no for my 70th birthday. We went to Tuscany and we rented a house and um, we went to the Domo in in Siena. Mm -hmm. So the Domo in Siena is very interesting because all the, the Domos are black and white stone. And the Domo in Siena, they never finished. So half of it's still like concrete and brick and stuff because they didn't have the money to finish it, which is one of the stories. Uh -huh. But we went into a room uh, where they had all the Gregorian chants all laid out in the books. And I can read the Gregorian chant. Don't ask me why. I took a class in, in my freshman year of school. There's useless talent for you, right? <laughs> and, I was, and I started to sing. And there was a ton of people there, and I, John and I got arrested. <laughs> you're not supposed to do that. And get out of here. You're not allowed in here anymore because, but I was singing. The, da, 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 da. 
And I did that in Ecuador a, a bunch of years before that, and, and nobody stopped me from doing it. But it was very interesting because, you know, it's not really a cleft, it's a cleft, but it's, it, uh, and so, uh, and the notes, and I was only singing the intervals. I had no idea what the notes were. You know, if a, uh, it was probably a, a bass clef of some kind, you know, it wasn't a treble clef. And the notes were, and the, and it was like, uh, in Hebrew, they have these little markings in the in the prayer book of where the songs are supposed to go, and, uh -huh. and they're not notes. And the rabbis, if you go here, go da, 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 and it, you know they had all these little. But the, the the priests had all these pieces of paper and these books where I mean it's all handwritten, uh, you know, right. way before Gutenberg. It's unbelievable. I'm sitting here telling you all this history. I did so bad in history in school. It, I just, it, I was not interested. But when but it became this is different. different. Yeah, this, this is different. But yeah. it's, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. It was my life. It is. It still is. That was part one of our interview with recording legend Howie Schwartz. Click the subscribe button below to make sure you get notified about part two.